What's up? I'm Vin, and today I want to take a look at the 2019 Calc BC free response question number three, no calculator. So let's get started. All right, for part A, what we have to do is we're finding the value of the integral from negative 6 to negative 2. I notice we were given a graph of f of x, but we have no idea what's going on from negative 6 to negative 2. But what we do know is that the integral from negative 6 to 5 of f of x, that's equal to 7. And this represents the area all the way from negative 6 all the way to 5. And we could break this up into multiple pieces. This is the same thing as the integral from negative 6 to negative 2 plus the integral from negative 2 all the way to 5. So if you think about this carefully, remember the integral represents the area under the curve. So the total area is equal to this part here, the area of this piece plus the area of this piece. So it's kind of like the whole is equal to the sum of its parts concept. Now this one here, that's given to us. So we just know this. This one here is the task. That's what we're trying to find. And this we can find. We're not going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus. We're going to be using the other interpretation of definite integrals. That is the area under the curve. Now, if you wanted to, I guess you could write a piecewise function for this, but that's going to take you a ton of time. So just use the area under the curve. These are straight lines and quarter circles. So we're just going to use basic geometry. Now, for the first part, this is given negative 6 to 5. That integral works out to just 7. And this is equal to the thing we're trying to find, the integral from negative 6 to negative 2. And then we've got plus. And now we can start calculating what is the area from negative 2 to 5. Remember, when you read an integral like this, just read it as the area from negative 2 to 5. And we have to break it down piece by piece. So we're going to find the area we're starting from negative 2 and we're stopping here. So the first piece that we have here is a nice uh, triangle. And it's a one by one, so the area is one half, one times one. So the area of this piece is just equal to a half. And if you look at the next triangle here, this has equal area to the one that I highlighted in green, but now it's just on the opposite side of the x-axis. So the first two areas, in a sense, just cancel each other out. So I have one half minus a half, so I'm starting with zero. And then the next piece here, this one is a little bit annoying to read, that this intersects the x-axis at 0.5. So this blue triangle has area 1 half times the base is 1 half, and the height is equal to 1 unit. So it's equal to a fourth. But remember, if the section that you're looking at is under the x-axis, you treat it as negative. It's signed area. Area is technically not negative, but if you call it signed area, then you could treat it as negative. So I have 0, I have minus 1 fourth, and then this next triangle coming up here, this is a, a big triangle, has dimensions. Well, let's take a look at it. Let's see what the dimensions are. So there's our right angle. The base is one and a half units. So I have one half times one and a half. I'm going to write as three over two. And the height of this thing is three units. So the area of that triangle is nine fourths square units. So that tells us what we need for this part. We have plus nine fourths because this stuff in purple is above the x-axis. Now, the last region is probably the most annoying to deal with. And you'll notice a little trap here is people might just look at that and say, oh, I have to find the area of a quarter circle, but be careful. You're not finding the area of this piece. You're finding the area between this curve, the quarter circle, and the x-axis. So it's kind of like one of those geometry problems where you find the area of the shaded region. So I would have to do, for this green area, I'm doing the area of this rectangle shape. Well, this is technically a square because it's going over 3 and up 3. So I do the area of the square, which is 9 square units, minus the area of the quarter circle, which is pi times the radius squared divided by 4. Now, to identify the radius of this quarter circle, like if you want to imagine the quarter circle, its center is in this corner here at 5, 3. The radius is just the distance from the center to any one of these points. So if you go to the left, you're going 1, 2, 3. So the radius is 3 units. Or I could go south. I could go 1, 2, 3 this way. So that tells us that the area of the green stuff on this part of the graph here is 9 minus 9 pi over 4. So we'll just write that. We've got plus 9 minus 9 pi over 4. 
Now the rest of this is just algebra. The hard part is over. So what we have to do from here, we're solving for the integral. We can combine a few things. Negative 1 fourth plus 9 is 8 over 4, and that's equal to 2. So I have 7 is equal to the integral from negative 6 to negative 2. We've got f of x. And now we've got plus 2 plus 9 is 11. And we've got minus 9 pi over 4. So then the rest of the algebra here, we're just going to add 9 pi over 4 to the left to cancel it out on the right. And if I subtract 11 on both sides, I'll have a minus 4. And that's equal to the integral we wanted to know, the integral from negative 6 to negative 2 of f of x. So here is our solution to part A. With part B, what we want to do this time is now we're going to use the fundamental theorem of calculus approach to evaluating definite integrals. The antiderivative of 2 times f prime of x is 2 times f of x. And then plus, we have the antiderivative of 4 is 4x. And this is being evaluated from x equals 3 to x equals 5. And from this step, now we just plug in. This is equal to 2 times f of 5 plus 4 times 5 minus, and now we have in parentheses here, 2 times f of 3 plus 4 times 3. So now we just have to simplify this stuff. But if we look carefully, the function value at 5, we're going to find much of this stuff from the graph. f of 5, if we look here carefully, is equal to 0 because the y value there is 0. So we have 2 times 0, which just cancels out. Now we have plus 20 minus, and now 2 times, they were polite. They told us what is the y value when x equals 3. The y value is 3 minus the square root of 5. So we could just replace f of 3 with 3 minus square root of 5. If they didn't give us that information, it would be a little bit mean, but we would actually have to write the equation of the circle x minus 5 squared plus y minus 3 squared equals the radius squared. The radius was 3, so if we squared is 9. And we would have to plug in x equals 3 to this and solve for y and make sense of it within the context of the question to get this. But once again, they were polite here, so we didn't have to go that extra step. And now we have plus 12 at the end. So now we just simplify everything. So here we're going to have 20. And I'm distributing, uh, well, I'll distribute the negative at the end. So we have 2 times 3 is 6, minus 2 square root of 5, plus 12. And now we just distribute that minus. We could add 6 and 12 is 18. So I'll have 20 minus 18. And when I do minus negative 2 radical 5, that's going to give me a plus 2 radical 5. And 20 minus 18 is just going to give us 2. So we have 2 plus 2 square root of 5. That's our solution to B. For part C, we want to find the absolute maximum value of G. And G of X is an area function. It represents the area under the graph of F. And when you want to find the absolute maximum or minimum, you want to find the critical points of the function first. So that means we're going to be looking for G prime of X first. And since G is an area function, we could use FTC the fundamental theorem of calculus part two. So the derivative with respect to x of an integral going from a constant to x of f of t, that's just gonna be equal to f of x. So to find the critical points of g, now we could just set g prime of x, which is equal to f of x, equal to zero. And this is true when x equals, and now we just have to look at the graph. So if we see here, this graph is clean, the graph equals zero or crosses the x-axis when x is equal to negative one and also when x is equal to positive one half. So from this step, what we wanna do is we wanna plug the critical points back into the function g of x along with the endpoints. Just know the absolute maximum and absolute minimum can occur at the critical points, but they could also occur at the endpoints. So you have to make sure that you include the endpoints x equals negative two and x equals five. So we're also going to throw negative 1 and 1 half in the mix. So now here, the reason why I included this graph is these areas are, are going to come in handy when we evaluate g of x. Because remember, g of x is equal to the integral from negative 2 to x of f of t dt. So from this step here, I'm just going to use the same integral and then erase. Because you don't have to show this part in your solution. You could just kind of do this part in your head. But g of negative 2 would give me an integral where the upper and lower limits match. So that's just going to equal 0. So we have one value filled out here. 
So then the next value that we're going to plug in is when x is equal to negative 1. And when x is equal to negative 1, now we just have to find a little bit of area. So the area from x equals negative 2 to x equals negative 1 is just this single triangle here, which we found before to have area equal to 1 half. So that's the value that we're going to record in our table. And then the next thing we want to do is we're going to use 1 half. So now we're going to plug in x is equal to a half. So if we do that here, when x is equal to a half, now we're looking from, we're starting at negative 2, but we're going all the way out to 1 half, which was up to this blue triangle here. So remember, this area and this area canceled out. We had 1 half minus a half is 0, and 0 minus a fourth is equal to negative 1 fourth. So that's going to give us this value here. And then the last one, we actually did this when we answered part A, the integral from negative 2 to 5, but we could just look at it once more. The integral from negative 2 to 5 was just the sum of all of those areas together. So that's just the last piece that we need to fill out our table. So we go out to 5, and we're going to get g of 5 is equal to the integral from negative 2 to 5. And here we've got 1 half minus a half is 0. Then we get negative 1 fourth plus 9 fourths is equal to 8 over 4, which was 2, plus 9 minus 9 pi over 4. So this part here simplifies to 11 minus 9 pi over 4. So all we have to do now is pick the biggest value in this list. And it's going to be the last one here. And if you have trouble with the number sense, just think. Let's say I rounded really far up and I let pi equal 4, which is really absurd. But you would see 4 over 4 would cancel, and I would have 11 minus 9 is 2. And 2 is bigger than all the other numbers. So this tells us our absolute maximum value of g is going to occur at x equals 5. So for the last part, now we just have to evaluate this limit. And this limit we could evaluate by direct substitution. This is going to be 10 to the first minus 3 times f prime of 1 divided by, and we have f of 1 minus arctangent of 1. So for this question here, we just have to look at the graph for the two values for f of 1 and f prime of 1. So if we go here, f of 1 is just equal to 1. So in the next part here, we just have 10 minus 3 times, this part will leave blank, but remember we just said that f of 1 is equal to 1, minus an arctangent of 1 is just equal to pi over 4. So the last piece that we need to find here is f prime of 1, but remember f prime of 1, the concept is that this is the slope of the function, so this is the slope of f at x equals 1. So if you just look, this is a line segment, and the slope you could calculate by just finding the slope between any two points on the segment. And the slope here is going to be 2 because it's going up two units over one unit. So we're just going to plug in 2 here. So to simplify this limit, we're going to have 10 minus 6 over 1 minus pi over 4. And this is equal to 4 over 1 minus pi over 4. Now the rubric tells you to stop here. You don't have to go forward and simplify this. If you wanted to simplify this a little bit more, you could call this 4 over 4 over 4 minus pi over 4, which would then give you 4 over 4 minus pi over 4. And this, if you rearrange stuff a bit, would be 16 over 4 minus pi. But if they don't tell you to simplify all the way, you could only get yourself into trouble by doing more algebra. So we could have stopped at this step. Okay, well, this is going to conclude this video on the AP Calc BC 2019 free response question three. If you found this video to be helpful, please like and subscribe. It really helps me grow the channel. And if you got any requests, just leave the topics you want me to cover in the comments section below. And thanks for watching.